Hi, Elizabeth. Hello. Okay, so the chastity plot, um, the last word about eunuchs, virginity, and innocent re innocence restored. The chastity plot, the chastity plot, and now the plosticity chat. <laughs> And I was going to do a Steve Coogan thing there, but I won't, I won't do that. No. Uh, this book is a triumph. Mm -hmm. It's the fruit of many, many years work. And I've watched it grow and be pruned over the years into its currently right full form. And it's, uh, this will not be an impartial uh, discussion. <laughs> uh, I, um, Elizabeth and I are close friends and we share much in common intellectually. Uh, so this will be a completely partial account of the discussion of the book. Buy this book, read this book, and read all of Elizabeth's work that will follow. Uh, I didn't realize that the comatose rape, rape book has a title now, she did it in her sleep. So that's, <laughs> so whatever you do, don't nod off during this discussion. Um, this is important work, uh, The Chastity Plot. It's a cocktail of great erudition, historical awareness, a driving, compelling argument compounded in stories, where stories are arguments. And there's a compelling, there's refreshing disregard for modishness. Chastity is not a fashionable topic, but it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, a refreshing disregard for then and now claims. How is this relevant to us? It just is, read it. And uh, a really nimble movement between deep textual analysis of a whole range of figures, Spencer, Richardson, Euripides, St. Paul, uh, contextual historicizing while keeping open a, a playfulness with regard to high and low cultural distinctions. There are discussions of Fleabag, the mighty kinks, even a reference to Lady Brienne of Tarth from Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. And it will hopefully do for chastity, virginity, eunuchs and innocence, what say Marina Warner did for the Virgin Mary, Sandy Cavell did for comedies of remarriage and what I was reminded reading the book and I've read a lot of the book in draft and reading it in, in, in print form, uh, reminded of Caroline Bynum's work on traditions of effective piety in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also the absence of any uh, easy moralism or political point scoring is really uh, refreshing because we're all exhausted by that. And the range is incredibly ambitious from uh, antiquity to right now passing through much that went on in between, again, moving between high and low effortlessly and um, with enormous fluency, but never sacrificing depth and careful reading. And the, the, the claim that's being made is uh, um, how we're gonna proceed or how I wanna sort of turn this over to, to Elizabeth because it's, it's, um, it's Elizabeth's book. But the claim that's being made is very uh, broad. On page 14, um, Elizabeth writes, my argument is that chast the chastity ideal has profoundly influenced a number of the West's social and personal aspirations, modifying the ways individuality, subjectivity, and psychological norms have been imagined in the modern world. So the chastity plot is uh, a key to, uh, in many ways, the, the book is a, 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 is a treatise on sexual ethics and chastity in relation to such an ethics. So we have this chastity plot as the overarching plot, and we're gonna start by finding out what that is with readings or whatever Elizabeth wants to say. And then there are other plots, there's the eunuchs plot, and there's the maiden's plot. So we have chastity, we have eunuchs, who doesn't love eunuchs? And we have maidens, and then we have the plot of, 
the maiden, which is in many ways the, the marriage plot. And uh, so a lot is at stake. There's a lot going on in, in, in this book and it's incredibly impressive how it's all been brought together. So, I mean, what I don't like about uh, with book discussions is to just, we talk about the book. I mean, to get, we need to get into the, the rhythm and the, the movement of the sentences. So uh, Elizabeth and I agreed that the, she'd do a couple of readings and maybe we can begin with, well, you could say whatever you want now and then just sort of begin with the first reading and then we can talk some more and then go into the second reading and then take it from there. Yeah, no, no, thank you, Simon. Uh, that was a brilliant introduction. And if anybody uh, knows the course of this book, I'm afraid to say it is you. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, as you say, it, sexual ethics is on the table, um, but it has to be acknowledged that, um, certainly for me, the, you know, the poetics of chastity, the aesthetics of chastity um, have been just as important uh, as the ethics. Uh, indeed, I find it often very difficult to disentangle uh, ethical questions from aesthetic questions. And I suppose because of that, and because I like telling stories, uh, it really is uh, stories I want to begin with. Um, and I want to start with um, two virgins because you know, they should have the, the, the first, and if not the last word, certainly uh, the major word. Um, so two virgins, uh, my virgins are called Tekla and Pamela. Um, one dates from the early days of Christian hagiography and is set in Turkey. The other comes from England and it's the middle of the 18th century. Both are legends loved in their own day and widely read for many years, testimonies to the power of belief over the power of fact. They share an intention to explain how chastity is fought for and what the battle for chastity can do for the glory of those who prevail. Tekla was a young and noble virgin from the city of Iconium in present day Anatolia. Engaged to a suitable young man named Tamiris, Tekla was everything a modest young lady should be. Then she looked out of her window, indeed modest young ladies don't get to do much more in public but look out of the window, <laughs> um, and she saw a crowd going into the house of her neighbor where people were seen clustering eagerly around a small man, bald-headed, bandy-legged, of noble mien, with eyebrows meeting, rather hook-nosed and full of grace. He seemed a bit like a man and a bit like an angel, but it was his words that captivated Tekla. For three days and nights, she did not move from her window. She would not eat or drink. All she wanted to do was to hear about virginity and to soak up the words of St. Paul. Paul's eloquence about chastity drove Tekla away from the marriage everyone wanted for her. She chased after the apostle, following, it, following him into prison. Condemned, tied to a stake, and set alight, Tekla was saved by a divinely sent rainstorm. She traveled on to Antioch where she was threatened with rape, thrown to the wild beasts, and saved again. Finally, the authorities let her go acknowledging that Tekla was simply too much for them. Dressed in male clothing, Tekla followed Paul, and it's not absolutely clear that Paul wanted Tekla to follow him, but uh, <laughs> had her own, her own plans. And after Paul's execution, she lived on for 72 years, most of it in a cave. Tekla was a marvel to her contemporaries, an inspiration to aspiring female ascetics for the next 1500 years. Other defiant virgins met a martyr's end. Tekla, protected by the Christian God, stands out as one of chastity's irrepressible warriors. Pamela Andrews was the modest and pure heroine of the most popular novel of its time, Samuel Richardson's Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded, published in 1740. She was a well-behaved servant girl of 15, who had studied carefully in the 18th century school of virtue. 
assaulted by her aristocratic master, subjected again and again to harassment, confinement, and a number of attempted rapes, Pamela saved herself by the force of her integrity, her cunning, and her ability to faint at the right moment. Humble in her birth, Pamela would have been expected to minister to the pleasure of her betters. All it took was one small slip to make her spoiled goods, easy prey for a master and his fellow rakes. An everyday occurrence, the fall of a lower class woman hardly registered on the social map. Her ability to remain upright should have occasioned even less attention. But Pamela was different. Her struggle against any violation of her physical person is a marvel of heroic prudery and an early triumph for the middle class sexual morality Richardson advocated. Victorious at last, Pamela ab uh, abashes all detractors and convinces a skeptical upper class society that her modesty is the model all women should follow, especially if they want to end up as she does, married to her tormentor, her virtue rewarded by her social elevation and the readers of her story gratified as Ian Watt puts it by the combined attractions of a sermon and a striptease. Tekla and Pamela are both paragons of virtue, but in different registers. Their stories instantiate two versions of the chastity plot. They stand at opposite ends of a history from the first century of Christian agitation to the England of the mid 18th century. If we are to appreciate these two versions, we must understand the value of what they represent. If chastity does not matter, then neither do they. What price a maidenhead? Since Tekla and Pamela are heroic, their story is exemplary, there is more here than meets the eye. Wild and hungry beasts step back. Flames do not consume the virgin who values her integrity more than her life. Lower class girls with no name and no property turn the powerful into penitent believers, enthralled by the mystery of a virgin who says no. Chastity is magic is one of my claims in the book. Mm -hmm. um, it, can be called, it can be a sacrifice that elevates our fallen flesh to the condition of the angels, as such church fathers as Methodius, Ambrose, and Gregor of Nyssa believe. Or it's trivial, the affectation of a prude and a calculating fortune hunter. Chastity is much ado about nothing, as the title of Shakespeare's comedy has it. My question is, can it be both? Is there something here we need to know. Yeah, so thank you. So can it be both? I mean, is the chast chastity is magic on the one hand, it's the elevation of the flesh to the condition of angels and mm -hmm. it's uh, much ado about nothing. And a couple of pages further on you quote, um, Benedict in Shakespeare's much ado about nothing. The world must be peopled. And the chastity plot says, says why? Uh, which of course raises a really interesting issue, doesn't it? That, that if, um, if, the, if Christian charity, if Christian chastity had been successful, then we wouldn't be here. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, human beings would have died out and maybe that would have been better. You know, there was this question, you know, why reproduce? Why, why breed? And, um, and chastity is a huge problem in relation to that. So, so, how, so how is it both? How is it both uh, magic and uh, nothing much? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is why it's hard to kind of keep you know, the glamour um, and what I would, you know, like to think of as the grandeur of, of chastity in view, because the, the history of its, of its pettiness, uh, of its power to repress, to subordinate, to, you know, to cast women in a, you know, passive, sometimes rather childlike um, role, um, can't be denied. Um, you know, to say, uh, be chaste, be silent, be modest, mm -hmm. uh, be dutiful, is, is not the kind of words most women want now or 
probably in the past to hear. Certainly Tekla um, wasn't ready to hear that. Um, virtue, yes. Um, piety, yes. Um, but not obedience. Um, so to try to sever chastity uh, from its reputation, you know, as a justification of obedience, um, a justification of a subordinate role. It's not to say that that's my purpose in the book, but I do want to expose um, these tensions and these tensions were not cleanly resolved uh, by the church, by Christianity in all its history of, of recommending chastity, of saying, you know, chastity, virginity, you know, the highest virtue, of course, the, you know, the married, um, faithful, pious spouse is a good thing. And the marriage bed, you know, St. Paul assures us, is not polluted. Uh, marriage, you know, was there from the beginning, you know, in, in the garden, in yeah. Genesis, in the Garden of Eden. Um, we weren't there to just kind of wander off um, and, you know, exchange conversation. We were there to have sex. Um, so how does the Christian cult of chastity um, get around that? How can it explain on the one hand, um, this you know superior power of chastity—it's—it's—it's—it um, it's, it's, it is a means to bring about the end of the world. Quite so. Um, right. Just to take us away from you know this realm, this kingdom, this order of things into a higher one. Um, and if that means that you know the generations that have existed are coming to an end now, we can take it. All right. Um, there's going to be something better, more more sublime, uh, more unrecognizable. Um, but that wasn't really very good for the church as an institution. You know, it, right, needed, right. it needed to acquire members. It needed to get adherents. Um, it needed to become, you know, a, a force in the public world, a, a social force. Um, and, you know, not that it began equivocating, but I think the, you know, the willingness to give a role, however, grudgingly uh, to marriage and at the same time uh, to celebrate chastity, um, has been something interesting and, and you know, certainly a problem uh, within Christianity. And for me, a problem that, you know, recent abstinence campaigns, um, Protestant and, and American and, you know, you name it, um, mm -hmm. you know, agitations in favor of, well, let's call it prudery, um, certainly restraint, um, you know, sexual abstinence before marriage, premarital chastity, um, has been kind of carried on with this, you know, contradictory line, this contradictory wish, um, that the chaste would also become married, right? That the mm -hmm. virgin was going to, you know, give up that which gave her her special meaning. Um, the monk was going to be an outlier, you know, a freak, somebody you admired, but you didn't really want to emulate. Um, so how could it continue to, you know, glorify and glamorize chastity um, while also holding in front of, of people, um, you know, the same, the same moral deal um, that that moderate and wise pagans had given the same moral deal that that Jews and indeed you know most religious um, communities um, you know take seriously um, that the family is a good thing and that marriage is a good thing that reproduction is is a duty. For yeah. the chaste, reproduction is not a duty. Right. Right. Yeah. That, that's. I mean. That's. That's what. I mean. You know. The. Um, I mean. The, the. The first reading that. Tecla and Pamela, uh, you know, these are kind of bookends to the history of the chastity plot um, with, 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 with Paul, with Christianity until the 18th century. And it, you, you describe Richardson's Pamela and um, Clarissa as, you know, where the chastity plot, uh, where the plot is lost as it were, um, and the um, chastity is um, a feature of Christianity, you know, and it's um, and that and that and this, and this is this is a very uh, a very Christian book in a, in a in a whole number of very important ways because. Uh, of course, many people are ignorant of Christianity, and they're they're as they're as as ignorant of it as they are shaped by its concepts, mm -hmm. um, particularly with regard to sexual ethics. So, in a sense, the uh, the history of the, the genealogy of chastity, which you uh, you give here, is is incredibly important. But the um, there is something. I mean, there are. I mean, there are also. I mean, there are there are pagan 
there are chaste pagans. There's the example of Hippolytus in Euripides that you, you, you devote a whole chapter to. But the, the specific quality of, of, of Christianity here is, is very interesting. And also that the, the um, we've, we've, we've covered to some extent the, uh, the, the chastity plot with regard to the maiden, mm -hmm. say Pamela, mm -hmm. but then there's also the other uh, part of the chastity plot, which is the eunuch. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was fascinated looking again at the, uh, the book and then read the, reading the epigraph, which I remember uh, I, I recently listened to the whole of the New Testament read by Johnny Cash. <laughs> and uh, it was great, it lasted about 18 hours. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is this line, Matthew 19, 12, which you, is one of your three epigraphs. Uh, for there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. There are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. <laughs> which is an extraordinary thing to say. Jesus is basically, if you can, if you can handle it, yeah. do it. You know, and of course, origin, yeah, father of the church does it and uh and was never made a saint because he castrated himself uh so there's this kind of you know so let's let's just maybe let's think about eunuchs how do how do eunuchs how does the eunuch plot fit into this We've got the chastity plot the maiden which ends up as like a marriage plot and then we have the eunuch let's say a few words about eunuchs I mean, you know, as I see it, the eunuchs plot is 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 the major plot, um, and yes, absolutely, you know, steeped in Christianity, um, steeped in this, you know, kind of carelessness about the ongoingness of the world. Um, that you know, um, better to, you know, if 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 you need to give up whatever, give up, you know, your body um, if you can get something uh, more incredible um, without it, um, or you know, it, it, under conditions of of pretty extreme uh, violation and self-harm. Now it has to be said, yes, Origen uh, couldn't make it all the way into sainthood. Um, you can't read it, you can't be a priest if you're castrated. I mean, this is a way in which Judaism, right. and, Judaism and Christianity, um, you know, diverge from like, you know, the priests, uh, you know, around Attis, um, the galley and, and, and so on. Um, you, you know, you need those genitals if you're going to, you know, perform um, you know, the services, if you're going to officiate um, uh, at sacrifices in the temple. I mean, you know, some kind of pre-ritual uh, purity um, is recommended or, you know, you know, advocated in Judaism and I think in, in, in you know, in, in Greek religion. Um, but the, you know, the body of the male priest isn't supposed to become unmanned uh, in order to be you know, in a closer relation to the God. Um, mm -hmm. That was possible in other, other religions, but, um, you know, Christianity, I think, with its Jewish heritage, uh, couldn't quite um, turn, you know, castration as the you know, universal ticket of entry into the religion, and and you know, it would it, it, it wouldn't have succeeded as well as it did. Um, but in some sense, it's you know, it's given up one of the because these are you know the very few things that Jesus says uh, about chastity. You know, he he uh, denounces those who are you know quick to denounce um, the prostitute. Yeah. Um, the sexual deviant, um, you know, they are just as welcome um, as, as anyone else. Indeed, Mary Magdalene is, is the one he loves. Mm -hmm. um, but here he's saying, this is only for a few. I mean, and, and that is the case of the major plot. The, the, the eunuch's um, transcendence of the flesh um, not only is not for everyone, it shouldn't be for everyone. Uh, it is a way of becoming elite. Um, and yeah. those who try to embrace it without having you know, the character and the fortitude for it are going to create much more damage um, than they would have otherwise. Yeah. And, and, you know, falling short, you know, once you've made this vow um, is probably worse than not making the vow at all. Yeah. Uh, so part of the eunuch's plot, I think, is, you know, to separate the sheep from the goats, um, to remind, you know, to remind the community of Christians that their time on earth is just a time of passers-by, that this, you know, they're, they're not to really embed themselves in the social world. Um, they're not to value 
you know, the authority and power and rank of the social world, you know, they, they have a different birth, they have a different destiny. Um, but that plot was, you know, incredibly hard to sustain um, and never, you know, designed to be uh, universal. So accommodation uh, with the marriage plot, uh, I suppose, was there from very early on. I mean, Peter was married. Um, the, I guess the other way one could, you know, give some credibility back to the Unix plot um, is to think about, you know, a figure like the goddess Artemis, uh, that, there, that there, there were, you know, outside of Christianity, uh, concessions made um, to the intrinsic interest of this life outside of marriage, uh, outside of sexual passion, um, wild, natural, uh, mm -hmm. innocent in a kind of uh, rough way, you know, you know, in a sense, raw. Um, so those who want to follow Artemis um, do get an exemption uh, from, the, from the marriage bed and, and from the family. But that remains in, in the realm of, of myth. I mean, as we see with Hippolytus, you know, somebody who got the point, you know, took it seriously, uh, wanted to reject women, thought, you know, if there has to be reproduction, why can't we just go buy children in the market? Um, why do we have to do this, you know, this sordid, slimy thing? And, and, and why do we have to accommodate ourselves uh, with women when we'd much rather um, be running in the woods and, and hunting? So he yeah. thought he was doing everything uh, to be everything Artemis wanted, um, but gods and goddesses um, are not that easy to propitiate. Well, the reminds me is that but Hippolytus, is, yeah, it, it's interesting, I mean, you know, Hippolytus, you know, he thinks he can, you know, follow Artemis, you know, hunt a lot, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> women, are, <laughs> women, women are trouble, and then, he, but he enrages Aphrodite, and then you know, he's torn to pieces, um, and meets a, meets a terrible end, particularly in Seneca's version of it, but, but the link between, um, uh, Chastity. This is this is going towards the end of the book. I want to get to the second reading, but the uh, the links between misogyny and sexual purity. So, in the case of um, uh, Hippolytus, it's clear he doesn't want to be around women. He wants to hunt, and um, the links between misogyny and se sexual purity. And if we want to, and you, you, at the end of the book, you talk about toxic chastity. In relationship to, we used to the I used to talk of toxic masculinity and you know so on and so forth, but toxic chastity, and that in relationship to um, the rise of uh, incels and groups like that, you know, uh, which which is which is uh, a phenomenon which has you know uh, appeared in the last last ten years with an ever with an ever greater greater force. So there's a sense of uh, a kind of a strange kind of return to chastity there, uh, which we could, which you make reference to, but what do you think about that? Misogyny and sexual purity. Pretty, pretty, pretty revolting. Um, yep. But I guess, you know, it does um, give some support to my view that there's, you know, there's a horror in chastity, uh, a violence in it. It's, it's, it's not so benign. It's, it's not so accommodating. Um, if it's involuntary, as the incels say, it certainly goes along with this rage, um, you know, a similar rage against the, you know, the dirtiness of women's bodies, um, the fickleness of, of women's sexual desire, all this mess that you would much rather control. I mean, you could control it by just making, you know, mechanical women or um, I guess, you know, um, developing them in test tubes. I mean, there, there might be other ways of, of, of getting around this problem of, you know, born of Eve, you know, born, born as we are, reproductive bodies, um, we, we pose a problem. We pose a problem uh, for you guys. Um, yeah. And chastity has also had that role as a way of, you know, keeping women in line, um, you know, drawing a veil over their sexuality, over their aggression, over their unpredictability. Um, the chaste woman is supposed to be a knowable woman. Um, but, you know, in, in many ways, this is the opposite of a case. So, you know, if you the, the, the real innocent, um, the maiden who has no experience of uh, sexuality is also kind of outside of society. Um, and I think that's the other side of uh, the violence or the kind of antisocial character of, of chastity. Um, you know, it, it can be threatening. Um, it's, it's probably right that it's threatening. I mean, Freud, you know, talked about the taboo of virginity yeah. uh, and the ways in which, you know, you know some societies you know, develop rituals or, you know, basically to kind of do something to that, you know, difficult 
uh, right of, of, of passage, uh, defloration. Um, what sort of violence is that? Um, is it something that can just be, you know, done as like, okay, you know, you, you get your 16th birthday party, um, you know, you lose your virginity, it's all fine. You know, you, 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 know, you take off your, your white dress and you, you know, come in from playing with the bears uh, and there you are, you know, in, in the sitting room. Oh, right, the brow room. Room. yeah, the brow room, the bear, the bear. Um, yeah. yeah. So taming, taming the, the, the virgin um, is a theme that comes up you know, a lot in the history that, that you know, I've, I, I researched. Um, that the virgin, here the female virgin more particularly, um, whatever she still holds of the eunuch's plot, I think is responsible for this, you know, this strange uncanniness, uh, the, the terror that is in, in, in you know, her separateness. Uh, her body is not necessarily there to be shared. It's, it's not necessarily permeable. It, it, you know, it's kind of you know, radically, not yours, uh, not possessed. Um, and maybe that's part of the, the incel's rage. I don't, there can't be a female incel, can there? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get into, let's get into the, I mean, the, the book is, I mean, is it, it's this extraordinary uh, range, uh, extraordinary historical sweep. And, you know, we end up, uh, you know, with references to, the current context, but really, you know, uh, I mean, working, working kind of backwards, we've got, you know, discussion of Richardson, uh, Clarissa, um, Spencer, the fairy fantasy of uh, Spencer, which is very important to uh, the argument um, versus Shakespeare and Shakespeare's sexual realism, which wins out. Over, uh, uh, over over Spencer and both of those as uh, responses to you know Elizabeth, the mm -hmm. fact that there could be a, a chaste virgin queen and this and she could take on the predicates of the Virgin Mary um, as uh, as sovereign and and then also the way in which that can be bequeathed that there's something peculiar, particularly in Britain. Uh, and so in, in Britain, there can be uh, female leaders, but in a sense, they have to be chased at some level, right? Same was also true of Margaret Thatcher, in a sense that she, you know, I mean, I don't, didn't much care for Margaret Thatcher, or even Theresa May, in the yeah. sense that they were, <laughs> their authority derives from a certain, ex, you know, exuding a certain, anyway, but, that, but anyway, working from the end of the book, Elizabeth, then we go into chapters four and five was the second that which is what you call the the intellectual uh, core of the book and uh the second reading is going to be from from there and um so maybe we could move you could introduce that and we could move into that second reading which is, i think is from chapter four yeah thank you um yeah so this this is part of you know what i've uh, described as the you know the major plot the the evolution um, and you know various paths of the Christian story, um, and it's from a chapter called "The Dangerous Mystique of Continence." Uh, so this is more a historical chapter, and, and also tells a story. Okay, in the period between the travels of Saint Paul and the High Middle Ages, a new dream came to plague the souls of Europeans. That dream is best called the Romance of Renunciation an ideal, a program, a practice, and a fantasy. It was one of the most remarkable of the intellectual innovations of the ancient and medieval world. Its story is not that easy to tell. Its evolution was not entirely smooth and its objectives are often unclear. Sometimes as Nietzsche notes, the goal was to find ways to spiritualize the passions. At other times, nothing less was demanded than extirpation, castration as a universal dream. Yet despite all the efforts of saints, hermits, fanatics, and monastic administrators, renunciation's conquest of the spiritual field was never complete. It won the hearts of its adherents in varying degrees. The more extreme degrees of self-mortification were reserved for those with a special vocation the spiritual athletes who pursued a life of sustained martyrdom, 
who made denial a career. For the rest, and that includes most of us, moderate forms of sexual refusal or avoidance were prescribed. And it was those customs and practices that made the greatest impact on the culture of the West for at least one millennium and perhaps two. However you lived under a Christian sky, whatever were the compromises you made and the varieties of desire you accepted for yourself, you could not ignore the fact that there was a war on the flesh. And in this war, there would be winners and losers. In a brilliant and quirky book called Pagans and Christian in an Age of Anxiety, the great E.R. Dodds looked at the flamboyant behavior of late antique ascetics, hermits, flagellants, and anorexics, at saintly and celebrated feats of fasting, prayer, self-accusation, and sleeplessness, and asked, where did all this madness come from? And that's actually been part of my interest in the book, you know, trying to give an answer to Dodds. Uh, where did it come from and where did it go? Um, another way of explaining where it, it went to, um, you know, is, is basically the, the, the fate of Christianity. You could, you could write the whole yeah. history of Christianity in terms of the accommodations uh, it devised between sex and non-sex. Right? Um, Christianity made its way into history on the, on the strength of several dramatic plots. Models of meaning and value that reshape the possibilities of nature, time, power, and the human stuff. One was the odd but intriguing story of a God who relinquished omnipotence and impassivity to become a man of sorrows, a creature sharing the human condition and all its weakness and pain. Another was the story of fallen redemption, error and recovery. Yet another was a dream of life restored beyond the grave with a condition of bodiless eternity promised as a reward for the life of denial and faith. The one that inspired this book was the story about the purifying powers introduced through the sacrifice of human sexuality, the story I've called the chastity plot. Mm -hmm. All of these stories are odd, that they succeeded in convincing so many people that they were plots in which so many individuals wanted to invest their lives and hopes uh, deserves attention, even from moderns who think themselves immune to their appeal. Christianity's romance with sexual renunciation was not inevitable. That it was a successful romance, each member adapting to the other's strengths and weaknesses may have been a matter of chance rather than intention. As a foretaste of the kingdom of heaven ex extended to the early Christians, chastity could be loved and admired. As such, it was open to all, all who could, as Jesus said, receive it. And that included the sex whose spiritual character was widely belittled by the communities Jesus came to provoke. Women were believed by pagan and, Jew and Jewish cultures to have only a secondary place in the scheme of things. They were fashioned to bear children and serve the males and their families. With the gospel of chastity, they got a second chance. In this respect, they were on a par with men. Maybe biology would not impose the boundaries of their existence. Maybe the art of virginity about which church fathers like Basil of Ancria in the, in the fourth century, about which he wrote with such painstaking practical detail, uh, maybe it could interrupt the regime of natural appropriation and desire that had long made women the passive object of masculine need. Then through the vigilant chastening of the body and the senses, it could teach the soul how to acquire its long for incorruptibility, its innocence. Virginity represented a foretaste of existence emancipated from corporeal and procreative necessities. This freedom was of course also offered to males. Ascetic monks, their spiritual directors taught, would be able to, to leave the flesh while staying in the body. And this was the, the way in which the, you know, the, the you know, let's, frankly, the end didn't come. The eschaton was delayed. You know, yeah. What to do in, in, in the interval? Uh, well, one of the things you could do was to try to become this sort of hybrid being, you know, this, you know, what Nietzsche talks about like half on the water and, and half in land, but here enjoying a suspended state between life and death. 
Um, and on, you could do that only if you labored continually and penitently to expunge from yourself all sexual impulses, thoughts, and sensations. And this was a whole task. There was a whole, you know, a um, lot of procedures, um, practices, disciplines, technologies uh, to try to undo the minds and, and, the, and the heart's attachment to sexual passion. So it wasn't just conceived as like a, you know, a, a carnal appetite. Um, you know, within Christianity, there's definitely a recognition um, that eros, that sex, uh, is a spiritual power as well. And I think in this case, um, women were on the forefront for, for a time. Uh, female virgins uh, in, in the early Christian years, expelling the attentions of men, despising the temptations of luxury, adornment, and ease, uh, could be something different. They could be sober, fearless, and self-possessed. Vessels of sanctity, aloof and self-contained like the angelic beings, the heroic race of famous virgins transcend gender. They have become something else as a result of their austerity, clear and limpid signs of a life yet unimagined, deviations from the carnal legacy of Eve. These female virgins astonish those fortunate enough to encounter them. They are, as their celebrants agreed, a mystery. Through the figure of the virgin whose kinship to the angels made her suspiciously androgynous in the eyes of the skeptical and the conventional, those curious about the secrets of inner purity can look through a window into the integrity of the soul. So, you know, I mean, I'm pushing this a bit. Um, it's great, know, it's great. There are those in, in you know, um, I guess the last 50 years of theology uh, has been, you know, a real renaissance of feminist theology, for one thing, feminist mm -hmm. uh, readings of biblical texts of the history of Christianity. And there have been very energetic attempts uh, to try to recover um, another path uh, that women did take and, and could have taken um, within Christianity. So I think the, the recovery of, of virginity, um, you know, the attempt to give it back some of its dignity, um, some of its dazzle, um, you know, I, I, I'm not putting myself outside the realm of, of feminist theologians. Of course, I am doing something very different because I'm also interested in, in the poetics of chastity. Um, I'm also interested in the way it led to, or it, it fed a cult of pure womanhood um, you know, the image finally of, of a passionless woman, you know, the, the kind right. of ultimate, um, you know, betrayal of the chastity ideal was to make a woman, you know, an angel in the house, you know, a doll who could be, you know, used for procreation, uh, but uh, about whose sexuality you didn't really have to uh, concern yourself. But also, I mean, the other, in the other side, and that, that bit you were just reading now is fascinating. It's the, the idea that, um, chastity gives women a second chance right that that and that's something that is uh maybe it's not unique to christianity but it is it's prominent within the uh, traditions of effective piety within christianity in, in particularly in the middle ages and i think i think what you know what i find so i mean neither you nor i are secularists in the the usual understanding of the word uh, and it's it's for me it's just that the there's such a um uh capaciousness in uh in in certain forms of christian thinking i mean so for example um uh you know, we could rethink or to re-describe or just, we'll just continue with what, what you've said about uh, virginity, um, um, gender and, and the rest, you know, this is what the, um, this, it's, it's that. So the gospel, the gospel of chastity gives women a second chance and it also gives male theologians another chance, people like Meister Eckhart, you know, yeah. in, in, this, in, the, in the German sermons talking about the need to become a virgin, you know, in, in the soul, right? Mm -hmm. Through this identification uh, with, with Mary, there's, a, there's also the Marian aspect of this, which is important, mm -hmm. that she was, you know, virgin and wife. So one can only be become espoused by becoming a virgin. Uh, in Amy Hollywood's, mm -hmm. you know, time on a phrase, the soul as virgin wife. Mm -hmm. And there is something very uh, peculiar and, and uh, Amazing about that that the the the, the body uh, that uh, that we find in 
uh, in certain traditions of Christianity is this, this hybrid, not genderless, but, you know, genderful body, which is, you know, a, a Jesus who can be a mother or a father or a, a, a Christ that can lactate, that can be, that can have a, that's born of a, and it just, it just gets very rich and very uh, confusing. So I think that the, the which is why, you know, the, the standard debates around religion just kind of miss the point, you know, um, of, of what Christianity is about. But maybe that's a separate topic but i think we agree. yeah no, no. I, I i think we agree on that um and also i wonder how you know um the idea of, of virginity and the you know the spouse who offers herself to you know to christ um, um the bridegroom who comes um with with expectation you know with longing um but in purity um that that you know which you talk about you know the way in which um, mysticism you know throughout well, from from the time of the of the church fathers, you get allegorical interpretations of the of uh, the Song yeah. of Songs, um, you know, in the third and fourth century. But in the Middle Ages, it really be, becomes comes into its own. You know, the kind of um, the mega script uh, for all imaginings of the, you know, the mystical union. And it is it is a marriage, and it's a marriage that um, takes on you know very curious and odd um, gender configurations very different um, physical, physiological configurations. Um, Christ is both, you know, our spouse as a husband, um, but also in some ways a wife. Um, and we, the Christians who are um, then wives of Christ, does that make us all female? Well, yes, you know, yes it does. Yes, it does, yeah. mm -hmm. It does. And, yeah. um, you know, to, to, to be unfaithful, as the, as the Jews knew, uh, was to be idolatrous. That, that you know, of course, the, there's a, you know a patient waiting of the, the bridegroom, and, and I don't know who's out there, <laughs> you know, out there inside in some kind of you know medieval pastoral fantasy, you know, plucking roses and waiting for us to come. But if we are led astray, um, then you know our infidelity is is revolting. It's horrible. We become whores. Um, that that's that was the other kind of um, you know sexual. Um, intonation within, you know, um, Judaism that the the match between the people and God uh, had to be, you know, a totally faithful and, and pure one. And there were so many opportunities to go astray. Yeah, there's a couple more things. That just, to, I mean, it, it's uh, <clears throat> I was going through the book uh, today as I, I was just going back through it, and uh, I was I was struck by how much. Uh, how many references to Nietzsche you, you make in the book? And yeah. I kind of hadn't really put that together. Of course, Nietzsche has the idea of the ascetic priest, the ascetic ideal, and it, this seems to be something which he's very critical of because it comes from St. Paul, who he, you know, he detests, but of course he most closely resembles. And, and Nietzsche's alternative to the ascetic ideal, it, it's not clear at all. What, will to power, eternal return, which is, you know, it's, it's so there's that, uh, in a sense, the, the 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 necessity for asceticism, right? And um, in the um, and also the book is is premised, it seems to me, upon the uh, uh, if you like the failure of the sexual revolution. Right? The, the the premise of the book is the failure of the sexual revolution. This kind of sixties dream of whatever that meant yeah. that has that went disastrously wrong mm. and it went disastrously wrong for, for women and and here we are in a time of what mm. new sexlessness asexuality renunciation well, you know what what is going on this is where i think it's i think the 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 um um I mean, where you end the book and you're not you're not you're not grandstanding or making or point scoring, as I said before, mm -hmm. but you, you end the book with this on page 321, you say, to do justice to the messy world of sex and gender, to fight misogyny and think more carefully about sexual ethics is not enough just to criticize the old. If we're to do justice to the messy world of sex and gender to work toward a sexual ethic adequate to the demands of the present, it's necessary to understand the history of those concepts that are available to us. The task of a genealogy is to provide such an understanding. Its promise, perhaps its hope, is that thinking through the presence of the past opens up an intellectual space for less shot-worn words 
bolder images, more capacious and unpredictable plots. It's a lovely sentence, final sentence. The, the, but what have you got in mind there? To put you on the spot, because yeah. it's a great closing, <laughs> and you're, you know, you're offering, in a sense, you're, you, you, you haven't, you, you're not trying to say, well, this is kind of where we are, relevance, but you're, you're kind of, there is this thing that uh, we can work towards a sexual ethic adequate to the demands of our situation, mm -hmm. And it's got something to do with the history of chastity. Mm -hmm. And there is a, there's a promise, there's a hope here. Yeah. And, and the work that you've done here is a genealogical uh, inquiry into the concept of chastity. And genealogy, of course, is promissory. It's always about opening yeah. something up. So... Yeah. Yeah, one, one hopes, one hopes. I mean, one of the things I know I'm against is, is condescending to the past. Um, and you know, treating them like oh, back there, you know, they just were were, were muddled or they were um, conformist. They, they they couldn't think beyond their assumptions. And and you know, by some miracle, uh, we're able to. Um, I don't have the next plot. I don't even have you know a fantasy of the next plots. Uh, I do think there's some way in which the you know the notion of chastity um, does deliver a certain image of integrity of autonomy, um, self-possession, selflessness, um, you know, almost, you know, an ability to, to step outside the social, which I, which I also uh, think of as, as, as very important. Yeah. Um, the alternative to marriage um, really needs uh, to be taken seriously. Um, that if the sexual liberation movement, you know, hand in hand with feminism, uh, was meant to give us uh, a place outside marriage, meant to give an alternative to heterosexuality. It didn't bloody well do that. Um, mm. I, you know, I just, I, do, I don't see it. And I think that needs uh, much more serious work, um, not just histories of, of marriage that, you know, tell us stories and, and you know, take us back through, through novels the way, you know, I like to do. Um, but thinking, what, you know, what does marriage mean? Why has it existed? You know, what claims does it make? What does it take to be married? What does that do to you? What kind yeah. of deformation of, of something and maybe that something is what I'm talking about is you know there's where Artemis was you know there's where the virgins were um there is something also that I blame um Protestantism which you know as you know I also have fondness for um for trying to create this like weird thing married chastity um, <laughs> How does that give us, you know, the eunuch and in, 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 in all his kind of weirdness um, and rebelliousness um, and, you know, the, the eunuch isn't afraid to scandalize good society. I mean, Greeks and Romans would have thought, you know, how disgusting, you know, how, how could you possibly, you know, want to undo the privileges of masculinity? The eunuch is willing to do that. Um, yeah. And the virgin who says no to marriage, um, you know, says no, very often the, the virgins in, you know, the time of Jerome, you know, some of these, uh, his correspondents are women who like, you know, they run away, you know, like Nora in the doll's house. Uh, they leave behind their children. Uh, they leave behind their clothes. Uh, they leave behind their money. They just go, you know, off into the wilderness. I mean, it's another, you know, kind of um, Huck Finn. Um, so that I also want to capture the idea of, you know, the wildness of innocence um, being something, you know, worth remembering. Um, and that shouldn't be always domesticated. It shouldn't always, you know, take the form of, yes, we can get this alternative satisfaction, uh, which is, you know, the undoubted pleasures of companionship, of, um, you know, intimacy, um, of sharing the mm -hmm. life with people. Not gonna deny that. Um, but I also want to, you know, push for um, the elsewhere uh, of the version and the anti-marriage plot. Um, so maybe that is, you know, what I'm, I, I do have a, a you know, a bit that I want to recommend. Yeah.